This is Design Safe Radio, where natural hazards researchers strive to make our society more resilient to everything nature throws at us. Hey, we're back on Design Safe Radio, and we're talking with Mike Motley, Abby, and Dakota from the University of Washington, having a great discussion about tsunami debris and the research that they've been doing at Oregon State University's Wave Flume. Let's jump back in. So, so now that you got all these, you know, various uh, characterized flows and and way the debris moves, what what are you going to do with that data? So, um, that's the big project for the summer. I, I think that you know, with each test, we ended up with what, like ten to fifteen um, individual time histories of data. So you're multiplying, you know. So we're sitting on. Um, basically thousands of, of time history plots of wow. forces and pressures and velocities and wave heights and things like that. Um, and all of those are going to be associated with different types of uh, debris configurations. Uh, we've also got accelerometers inside of individual pieces of debris. We were going to try to look at some of mm. the rigid body dynamics of the debris itself and how it interacts with one another. Um, and, and as well as high speed camera footage. And so, what do you mean by out. rigid body dynamics? I only vaguely remember what that means. Yeah, uh, so, so, basically, the, we assume that the, the uh, structure, the orange, we'll call it the orange box, um, the, the structure that's being impacted in the individual pieces of debris are not really deforming elastically in any significant way. So, okay. they are moving rigidly. And so, kind of looking at how the blocks would interact with one another. Um, through uh, you know rigid body motion of, an, of a single block moving around and trying to get a feel for how fast they're moving, whether they're bouncing off of each other, what's happening there. If we can tie um, uh, uh, peaks in the acceleration to forces that show up on the structure, things like that. Uh, okay. We haven't really uh, gotten too deep into that quite yet, um, but but that's the plan. So so to start to put together. Um, look for trends, look for, um, you know, what we can get out of this. Ultimately, what we'd like to be able to do is present a few additional design equations based not simply on, um, you know, a boulder of X pounds hits the building at X velocity, right? And so um, we're looking to kind of say, if you've got a, a coastal or like an evacuation structure that's surrounded by this many buildings, we would expect that to maybe turn into a debris field with a density of something and, and the density is based on the mass of the individual pieces. And so, you know, what does it actually look like on a structure when a, I keep saying a, a house falling apart, right? But a house yeah. that, that just kind of comes in and hits a structure, what does that look like for the loading? Because you see a lot of, of literature out there where they'll say, you know, debris was built up um, and you have to kind of guess, did the debris make the structure fail? on impact did the debris build up and dam on the structure and increase the hydrodynamic loads mm. or did the damage occur during you know even during the earthquake and we're just seeing debris that's caught up here and, and eventually really did nothing hmm that would be really interesting interesting to see it and especially as you kind of look at different regions of the world that are affected by tsunamis you know they've got all sorts of different characteristics of the built environment there some yeah. are more rural some are more urban some are in between or industrial and you can you know have way it sounds like way different types and number of, of debris that will impact a, partic a particular structure yeah and so ideally what we'll be able to do is to to kind of pinpoint some trend related to uh, massive debris um you know relating the the randomness of the configuration itself to um, what the loading would look like, what the damming might look like, see if we can, can get some prediction there um, and start building out and, and, you know, extending these studies where we would see fit. Cool. Do you, do you see kind of doing, um, you know, community and regional scale modeling using some, some of the tools that the Nary Sim Center down at Berkeley is developing? Yeah. Being so, able to say like, hey, we've, you know, got a Google Street View imagery of a particular coastal community and can kind of characterize what types of debris might be there. And then, you know, maybe place a notional evacuation center in different spots and see how that's affected. Is that the kind of thing you're looking at doing? I think future? eventually, I think eventually it's, it's a lot of parts moving around to that. So uh, one of our co-PIs, Pedro Arduino, uh, he's a geotechnical uh, faculty here at UW. 
he and I are both involved with the Sim Center directly. So we're both personnel on the, the Sim Center and have been working with those folks trying to um, you know, help with some of the tool development there. I think that um, what we have found is it's it's one highly computationally demanding. So trying to figure out what the yeah. point is, is, is a big uh, issue there. Um, two, there's such a disparate set of physics associated with everything, right? And so you've got your you know, inundation models where your scales are to the, the tune of kilometers or even, uh, you know, portions of degrees of longitude and latitude. Wow. Um, all the way to at the vicinity of the structure with a piece of debris, you're into centimeter scale, right? And so trying to figure out what we can do there. Um, the, the modeling plan that we have right now is to uh, use a coupled approach with, um, we do CFD or computational fluid dynamics modeling here uh, in, in my group. Um, we're doing that to basically uh, uh, start to build up and look at uh, how the fluid pressures would change around a built up debris field mm. or an individual piece. Um, and then Pedro and his group have been working with a, a software called the material point method, which looks at um, uh, kind of a, a particle based method where they're looking at the movement of individual pieces of debris. Um, the CFD models are less, um, less successful at, at looking at the movement of debris than they are looking at pressures on individual faces. And so by using the models together, I think we're hoping to see how the debris moves around in the NPM model. Um, then use the CFD models to figure out what the corresponding loads and pressure field look like. Um, and then couple that, you know, eventually, or I say couple, loosely couple or work with the inundation models. Or uh, I know I've seen some of the, the recent work, um, Pat Lynette down at USC was showing some work on um, kind of looking at individual particles and treating them as debris at the community level and just seeing what the the flow patterns would be. And so I think there's a lot of moving pieces there to actually get something that's usable, but that's part of the process is, is yeah. sitting down with the Sim Center and seeing what we think might work. So lots of, lots of job security <laughs> for sure. Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a complex problem that, I mean, you guys are no stranger to it being uh, from UW, but I'd say a problem that needs to be solved somewhat urgently from, you know, the, the threats that exist in the Pacific Northwest. Um, can you speak to that a little bit for people who may not be familiar for the, I mean, this isn't just theoretical kind of fun research, but it's got real world applications for some serious uh, potential hazards. Definitely. Uh, and, and so, you know, like, like I said, I, I mean, how many times do you think you've done an evacuation for Honestly, in my lifetime, uh, probably three or four yeah. evacuations. In wow. Time. Right. And so, yeah, so it's happening, you know, in real time. And, and fortunately, we haven't seen a, a huge significant event. Um, but even the Japanese uh, tsunami, you know, the, the waves coming across the Pacific caused a ton of damage to infrastructure, ports, you know, billions of dollars along the U.S. coast, um, in addition to, you know, what, what happened in Japan. Um, I think that that you know out here in the Pacific Northwest, where you can draw the map. I, I show this in some of my presentations: a map of the Pacific, where you see uh, sort of the Ring of Fire and all the places where tsunamis have hit since uh, 2004, um, and we're the only gap left that hasn't been impacted. And so, um, when you when you think about it like that, and you think about the fact you know there's been a lot of work done by uh, USGS and um, Brian Atwater uh, here at, at you know who works with UW, um, they have 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 uh, figured out that the last time we had a big tsunami event in the Pacific Northwest um, you know, was uh, in the year 1700, um, and and so you know doing the math that's 320 ish years, and the return period for the subduction zone is three to six hundred years. So uh, we're sitting right in the middle of it. Um, and, and the interesting thing about the tsunami uh, is based on the, the physics of the subduction zone, we kind of have one chance. We're going to, you know, if it happens, um, we get the one big one and then we wait another, hopefully wait another couple hundred years. And so yeah. um, we don't have modern engineering, uh, you know, in the region to figure out, you know, what will happen. We can do our best with our models and, and our predictions. Um, but it, it's also, it's going to happen at some point, maybe not in our lifetimes, but uh, it's going to happen.
Thanks for listening to today's episode of Design Safe Radio. This show is sponsored by the National Science Foundation grant number 1612144. You can subscribe to Design Safe Radio on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you find your podcasts. Please leave us a review so we can improve the show. Please also help others find our episodes in iTunes. Thanks for your feedback and support. You can find out more about Nary at designsafe-ci.org, on Facebook at Design Safe Radio, or on Twitter at Nary Design Safe. <laughs>